Well, just eight days before President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un are set to meet face-to-face -face in Singapore, North Korea is shaking up its military leadership. The country's top three military officials are out. Their replacements, younger, staunch Kim loyalists, who also are said to have experience interacting with foreign delegations. Now, this comes as preparations are in full swing for the June 12th summit, the first time a sitting US president will meet with the North Korean leader. And CNN international diplomatic editor Nick Robertson is in Seoul, South Korea. He joins us now live. Good to see you, Nick. So let's start with this latest development, the replacement of these three top North Korean military officials by Kim Jong-un ahead of the June 12th summit. What might this signal, do you think? So it's the defense chief, it's the uh, head of the army and the head of the army's political bureau. Um, these are obviously very influential positions. The, the head of the political bureau for the uh, people, the Korean People's Army is, uh, is an influential position in of itself because it is concerned uh, directly with the finances that are connected to the military, that the military has overview on, which includes, which includes a lot of business interests. However, what does this mean at the moment? It's not clear. As these newer appointees, uh, are be, uh, we're being told, are Kim loyalists, then, then one might reasonably assume that is firming up um, his, his power base. But we've known that's pr been pretty strong for some time and he's had a reshuffle in the military not so long back as well. So I think, you know, if we look at this, if we really step back from it, um, you know, the conclusion that's perhaps the best one to draw is that Kim is changing his position a little however that said you know when he decided or, or said that he was ready to accept a, a, a meeting with president assad of syria um you know he was sort of sticking to his you know sticking to a position of 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 a recalcitrant leader if you will that doesn't go along with the rest of the world so the message when he goes to see president trump uh, in a little over a week's time doesn't necessarily mean that he's reshaping um you know his key personnel behind him for some significant shift of uh, of, of character and of strategy no because he's making he's giving other signals that would indicate otherwise so it's very difficult to 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 try to sort of over um, overanalyze uh, this without more information. It may become apparent in the coming days, but it certainly is an indication that there is change underway. Was it mean left or right? Not clear. Right. And uh, Nick, uh, President Trump, of course, initially talked up this summit with notions of walking away with an historic deal. Now he's playing down those expectations. So what's the most that can come out of this summit? And why is Defence Secretary Mattis reminding everyone that US troops will remain in South Korea? Is that for Mr Trump's benefit or to calm nerves in South Korea and Japan? It certainly does seem to a degree to calm nerves in South Korea and Japan, and perhaps more so in Japan. Japan's defense minister at the uh, at the conference that uh, Secretary Mattis was attending in Singapore over the weekend expressed concern that President Trump was, was saying that he won't use the language that he calls, you know, extreme pressure, which is the language you use around the sanctions on North Korea. Uh, and there was concern, uh, particularly again coming from the Japanese defense minister, that, that Kim Jong-un hasn't put anything on the table. He hasn't made a commitment for denuclearization or about chemical weapons, biological weapons, ballistic missiles, and that to get a, therefore to get a meeting with President Trump, you know, the view from Japan, a staunch ally of the United States, is this really raises questions about what can be achieved, and that was their concern. So Secretary Mattis was saying, look, you know, trust uh, is what's key to our common security, South Korea, Japan, the United States in the region. We need to build that trust. We need to be open and transparent with each other. But it's in that strength in our trust and our common security security bond, we're not reducing our troops, um, that, you know, our diplomats can do their job. So if you will, in military terms, is providing sort of top cover for President Trump, saying that they're not going to withdrew, reduce the troops on the Korean Peninsula. That would have significantly worried the Japanese um, uh, Secretary Mattis, you know, playing the hand here that, that his making sure everything on his side is clear for President Trump to come in and do what is his intent with Kim Jong-un. Rosemary? All right. Uh, our uh, reporter there, Nick Robertson, bringing us up to date on the situation where it uh, is uh, it's nearly, what, 3.15 in the afternoon there in Seoul. Many thanks to you, Nick.
Well, Graham Ong Webb joins us now from Singapore. He is a research fellow at the S. Raja Ratnam School of International Studies. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Now, as we mentioned, you're in Singapore. That, of course, is where all the action takes place in just over a week from now. What's the most that can be achieved in this first face-to-face -face meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un? Well, yes, you're quite right. Uh, there's a lot of anticipation building up in Singapore, being the hosts of this uh, summit, this very important summit, very high stakes. And I think uh, observers here in this country and in the region uh, have a very low bar in terms of the expectation coming out of the summit. Uh, this is uh, an unprecedented historical event. Uh, we have a sitting US President, President Donald Trump, Mr. Kim Jong-un meeting, two heads of state, meeting eye to eye for the first time over this ongoing crisis, decades long crisis. And the bar is set pretty low because I think uh, for many of us, we think that just the two of them building rapport, striking it off and really establishing a working relationship would in and of itself be a huge success coming out of the summit. I mean, never mind the, all, the, uh, all the other declarations or agreements that we were expecting from it, but for the, these two important people in the room have to get along with each other in order to negotiate the terms of denuclearization. But is that more a success for Kim Jong-un because he, his father and his grandfather have been wanting to sit down with the US president for so long. Now they're getting that opportunity, but it doesn't appear that they're having to give very much up for that. You're quite right. And this is what concerns many of us, uh, that the uh, fundamental goals of the Kim Jong-un's regime, Mr. Kim Jong-un himself, uh, are actually quite different from the goal set out by uh, the Trump administration and all the other stakeholders involved in this critical issue. Uh, the goals for the DPRK really are quite simple. It's about getting that handshake in the room with the leader of the world's sole superpower and getting lots of cachet, a lot of legitimacy from that. Mind you, Mr. Kim Jong-un has had to work quite hard to earn his place uh, as the leader of the DPRK. It's easy to overlook that fact. It wasn't just handed to him. He's had to earn it over the last uh, few years and not less than a decade uh, upon coming to power in 2011. Uh, he's two steps away from this hereditary, hereditary rule of uh, Mr. Kim Il-sung. Uh, and so he's had to build his place uh, in the history of the DPRK. And so shaking hands with, Mr., uh, with President Donald Trump is going to build a lot of legitimacy, consolidate his power in the eyes of his own people, which will allow him to rule over the DPRK going forward for some time to come. But will he give anything up? And will he really venture into the realm of this concept of denuclearization, which of course means one thing for the United States and another thing for North Korea? Well, I would argue that he has to, and I think he knows this. And this is where I think we get into the, the sticky areas of this, uh, this whole uh, event uh, about what exactly uh, the DPRK, Mr. Kim Jong-un, the kind of concessions that they are going to make when they uh, meet with President Donald Trump on the 12th of June. I mean, something tangible clearly has to come out from this meeting. Uh, it's not certain what this tangibility is going to be, uh, but I think some concessions have to be made. And uh, coming back to the point about the three top uh, military officials uh, you know, being replaced by younger uh, generals. That could be a positive sign, it's still too early to say. I agree with the correspondent uh, earlier on, uh, but I think more needs to be done. Uh, so uh, one is expecting that he will address directly the issue of denuclearization, what that's gonna look like, and also the verifiability of, of that as well. In order for any lasting deal to be in place, the DPRK clearly will have to abide by this notion of verification and irreversibility. Graham Ong Webb, thank you so much for sharing your analysis with us. We do appreciate it and we'll all be watching very closely on June 12th to see what does come out of this summit.